The La Perouse expedition that sailed out of Brest in August of 1785 was a direct reaction to the three Cook endeavors. The first from 1768 to 71, the second from 72 to 75, and the third, as we've seen, from 76 to 80. It was easily the largest scientific venture that the government had ever financed and would continue to finance, notably an elaborate official report that mirrored the dimensions of Cook's report itself paid for during each tumult of the French Revolution. And while I've touched on Jefferson's disinterest in the expedition, at least in terms of correspondence, its scope and formal instructions would mirror what was to come from Lewis and Clark. Of course, they would be signed by the head of state, they would outline and equip the expedition with the tools for astrological, physical, botanical, geographic, chemical, zoologic, and mineral observations to take note of. They would sail under the banner of peace and inquiry, namely for the people who lived along each voyage's route, as well as a more discreet plan toward opening new trade routes and potentially settling the west coast of North America. A significant difference, however, is that Lewis and Clark would have to wear all of those hats at once while La Perouse had the benefit of geographers and scientists of all stripes, as well as artists, to say nothing of the quality of that element of the expedition. Unlike Cook, this expedition wouldn't really stand the test of time. I hadn't heard of it, at least, until I was an adult, and likely most know more about the end than about its time at sea. The expedition was helmed by two 500-ton ships, La Astrolabe, also known as the Quadrant, with 112 men helmed by Floriat de Langley until he and 12 sailors were killed during a stopover in Samoa, and La Boussole, also known as the Compass, with 109 men helmed by La Perouse himself. And as they left harbor in 1785, the end lay very much in the future. Welcome to Expeditions, a podcast around Lewis and Clark. We explore the history and historiography of the expedition one day at a time. We are everywhere at Expeditions Pod, that's social media, Patreon if you want to support the show, as well as our website. We are currently in Mile Marker 2, episode The Quadrant and the Compass. La Perouse was born in 1741, and by the time of the Seven Years' War, he had recently joined the God Marine and saw service during a resupply run on the siege of Louisbourg in 1758. He'd see service in the Anglo-French War in 1778 and would be part of, excuse my French, Expedition Particulaire that sailed in support of the American colonists in their war against Britain. He would also see action in Hudson's Bay, capturing Hudson's Bay Company Governor Samuel Hearn, what La Perouse had hoped would be a blow to the outfit, and France would be able to fill the void. We'll see how that went as we continue along. He would also be active in the Caribbean, teaming up with an American ally, Spain, in the planned invasion of Jamaica that didn't go great. The renown that he gained from the war led to his being appointed by King Louis XVI on an expedition around the world. He was chosen to lead a scientific expedition in Cook's Wake, but La Perouse was not a scientist. He was a country nobleman with a knack for logistics, and as Dominique Malacoste notes, quote, he is described by his biographers as simple, straightforward, honorable, and very fair, but he cannot be portrayed as a remarkable man in intellectual terms. He seems to have been concerned above all with fulfilling his duties to the king, and in the process of accomplishing his job, appears to have shown little interest in his surroundings. End quote. It wasn't necessarily his job to do so, but prior to setting sail, he did the work to procure the most cutting-edge technology, parlayed with members of the Cook Expedition on their breakthroughs in combating scurvy, namely the use of malt and fresh vegetables, though not limes, and receiving from Ledyard benefactor Joseph Banks two inclining compasses that belonged to Cook. La Perouse wrote in his journal, quote, I received these instruments with a sentiment of religious respect for the memory of this great man. The La Perouse expedition began on August 1st, 1785, and sailed south along the coast of Africa before turning toward South America, 
with a sojourn to look for the fictional Drake's Island before rounding the mighty Cape Horn in January of 1786. Before heading west, they discovered that their bread was infested with worms, so they stopped at Concepcion in the Governate of Chile from late February into March. They left Chile on March 19th and arrived at a bay named for Captain Cook when he last visited on March 1774. Under clear skies at daybreak, they landed at Easter Island on April 8th. At the same time that Ledger was in London, ill at ease with waiting for word from Catherine on the passport into the country. After a favorable meeting with the native population, though, as La Perouse notes, they, quote, do not have, like the Malays, Chinese, or Chileans, a character of its own, end quote. They continued from Cook's Bay to where Cook met his end. In Hawaii, he wanted to double check if Cook had completed his notes on the Sandwich Islands, as he called them, especially on the island of Maui. And like the mythical Drake Island, explore the vicinity to clarify maps, namely Spanish maps. In the Alalakeke channel, he wrote, quote, We were seamen in a burning climate limited to one bottle of water a day. The trees which crowded the mountains and the verdure of the banana plants with which native huts were surrounded produced inexpressible charms to our senses. But the sea beat upon the coast with such violence as to keen us in the condition of Tantalus, to desire and devour with our eyes that which we could not reach." End quote. After a few days, they set off towards Alaska, sighting the 18,000-foot Mount St. Elias in the fog. The cold and wet of the Northwest were an initial shock to the crew, though nothing Cape Horn clothes and brandy couldn't fix. On July 2nd, sailing south, they sighted a channel beneath Mount Fairweather. The following day, La Perouse ordered bull ships through the channel where strong winds almost smashed the frigates against the rocks. But once through, the deep water Latua Bay, a ford in the future site of what we today call a mega tsunami in 1958, provided what appeared to be calm from the roiling tidal flows, its harbor clear and surrounded by mountains and an enormous glacier. Here, the expedition would spend the following 10 days exploring the area, climbing the glaciers, seeing if there was a river that could constitute another mythical cartographic theory, such as the Northwest Passage. In his directions included an order, quote, to see whether there be not some river or some narrow gulf forming a communication by means of an interior lake with some part of Hudson's Bay, end quote. La Perouse would also meet the Clinket and wouldn't muster much beyond outright disdain. Like Ledyard, the observations were tinged with mainstream European social theories and politics, though where Ledyard contemplated his changing situation, La Perouse found himself railing against the collective philosophes, your Rousseaus, Voltaires, etc., and their views on freedom and savagery. Nature is sublime only in the larger view, but in detail it is less so, La Perouse writes. Quote, it is impossible to meet the man of nature because he is savage, deceitful, and malicious. It is impossible to live in a society with natural man, for he is barbaric, cruel, and dishonest. End quote. Malacuas notes that this was a common view of the Guard Marine on the verge of the revolution, and it stemmed from three things. One, class rivalry. The philosophes themselves were urban noblemen. Two, the conservatism of the country nobles like La Perouse, and three, the lack of a robust higher education. Quote, he has an instinctive reaction to philosophical ideas, the sort one might expect of someone who either does not know what he is talking about, or if he does, has not reflected on the matter. End quote. Despite La Perouse's feelings, when disaster struck on July 13th, a barge and two longboats were asked to make soundings at the bay's entrance as the bay itself was too deep to tread a map, only to be swept out into the breakers and capsized, killing 21 men. The Klingit did all that they could to help, though no bodies or wreckage were ever salvaged. La Perouse took it hard, and without bodies for a funeral, he named the island in the bay Cenotaph, which remains to this day. On July 30th, the ships left Latua Bay, traveling south down the Pacific coast. 
Cook's final expedition, of which Ledyard was a member, at least we forget, brought the fur trade to the public consciousness and effectively set off a race to which La Perouse was undoubtedly first. Ledyard himself, a distant second, he wouldn't head to St. Petersburg until December. However, the thick fog that any Pacific Northwesterner is very familiar with obstructed the coast at times, obscuring Nootka Sound and the lower Columbia as La Perouse decided against any more incursions and focused his ship toward Las Californias. A supposed volcanic eruption at Mount Shasta on September 7th was struck from the history books, well, the Smithsonian's Global Volcanism Program database, in 2019, as it was determined that the men had actually seen a large grass fire. At a stop at San Francisco Bay, the crew spotted Spanish forts in the afternoon and landed in Monterey Bay on September 14th. 1786. The day after La Peru pulled into Monterey, a young man, an officer, headed home. He'd been to Valence and recently to Lyon, where artisans went on strike over the rise in the cost of fabric, as well as the cost of wine. Momentum was pushing France toward revolution, but not yet. Weavers were hung, and the collective bargaining of the workers was quashed by the state, by the young men of the army, hastening Lyon toward further crisis. But that was, and so much more, in the future. For now, he was headed home, which he'd been writing about for weeks, musing on the philosophes that La Perouse dismissed. He wrote of his fierce love for his ill-starred homeland and desire for her independence. He'd say, if I had to destroy only one man to free my countrymen, I would leave at this very moment and thrust my sword into the tyrant's heart, avenging our country and its violated laws. End quote. He wished to write a history, and did, though what is believed to be the only copy burned in a fireplace after being exhumed from the Academy of Lyon. This man would remain off the coast of France for a year, leaving five days after La Perouse arrived in Petropavlovsk and Kamchatka. He would no doubt hear from the journey, as he himself made a preliminary list to join the voyage, though his age and homeland may have played unique factors in not being selected along with the known reason that he was selected by somebody with better astrological skills. Though it must have stung to know the accolades that they would receive and the doors that would open for them upon their return. Instead, Lafayette was calling for a truly national assembly in February of 87 to address the finances of the insolvent monarchy and this young man from Corsica, Napoleon Bonaparte. He didn't know it yet, but in one of history's wildest what-ifs, the old world of La Perouse was headed toward the reefs of the Solomon Islands, while Bonaparte, whose anonymous death would have meant nothing to us in this alternate timeline, would become his imperial and royal majesty Napoleon I, by the grace of God and the constitution of the Republic, Emperor of the French.